Hello and welcome to Eat Sleep Code, official teller, uh, podcast. I don't know, Seth Charbonneau, and with me today is John Burstow. How you doing, John? I'm well. Uh, I think your audio is a little bit messed up, but that's all right. We'll keep going. So this is an interesting post that caught my attention earlier this morning. This is Tree Structure Collection for .NET uh, developers. So for those who aren't aware, um, oftentimes you have to use a tree structure in memory. So it's important to note, like the, the author uh, talks about that this library is not a file system, but it does represent one in memory. And so a virtual storage library, uh, as in this indicates, is a .NET library that operates entirely in memory and provides a tree structure collection. So this is really useful in a lot of computer science um, algorithms. Uh, so if you're if you're utilizing things like items, directories, symbolic links, etc., uh, if you're doing if you're using those concepts and you want to do so in memory and you want to manage hierarchical data structures, this is a um, library that's now available to uh, allow you to do this. So um, it provides uh, things like a flexible file, uh, sorry, a flexible tree structure, uh, various node types. I would have loved to have had this when I was doing computer science back in the day. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely something uh, you can take a look at if you're at all interested from a .NET perspective. Um, as far as other news is concerned, stuff that we won't talk about, but um, .NET Conf is coming up, so make sure to check that out at .netconf.net. Um, that's a, that's going to be on November 12th and 14th. Um, my company, Octopus Deploy, is hosting an event called Shipped. Uh, you can learn more at octopus.com slash ship. That's a later in November. As far as events are concerned, uh, in-person events as opposed to online events, we've got GitHub Universe coming at the end of October. We've got Cube, uh, we've got KubeCon, uh, Cloud Native Con, North America, and Salt Lake City. That's in November as well. We're seeing a lot of events start to ramp up here, which is kind of cool from a community perspective, which is great. .NET Conf obviously is going to be really exciting. Uh, so if you're going to be attending .NET Conf, let us know. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, there's going to be a lot of great content there. There is a call for content open right now, so you can submit your sessions through Sessionize. So we, we had some, uh, what are they called? Um, design patterns on here last week uh, for React and Next. And this week I found some for solid principles, which are part yes. of design patterns. Um, some, of the, some of the things we talked about last week uh, go really well with this. So this is a React version of Solid, the Solid principles. So um, if you're a .NET developer, this is probably stuff you may have heard of before. Um, if you're a React dev, maybe not. So this should be a good read. So it talks about single responsibility principle. Um, you know, this is where a component, in the case of React, uh, should only have one reason to change, um, one responsibility. So you don't have um, a component or a function that does like a thousand different things. It just has one purpose and one purpose only. It's like uh, my my purpose is to pass the butter. If you've ever watched Rick and Morty, you'll get that one. <laughs> Open close principle yep. is uh, another one here. This is the uh, the O in solid, and uh, this means it should be open it for extension and closed for modification. So you want your code to be flexible uh, and you want to do that in a, an intelligent way so you can um, you can scale out your code but uh, reduce the amount of bugs. So you don't want people to actually modify the behavior or you want them to extend the behavior but not modify the behavior. So you know your, what you're getting from an object class function. Uh, but you also have the ability to be flexible with it and um, extend the behavior of that thing. Um, the substitution principle uh, this is where you should be able to replace the uh, superclass with a subclass. So you can, uh, you know, kind of like uh, dependency injection here. Um, you can easily drop in new components uh, built from the base class of, of that component and uh, use those items. Um, interface segregation principle. Um, 
you sh you shouldn't. It, this has to do with like dependency management, uh, so you don't want to uh, force things to depend on one another. Uh, dependency and in inversion. Uh, this is an inversion of control. Uh, so a lot of dependency injection systems are written around this principle. Uh, let's see what else we've got in here. Uh, that's all of them. That's solid. For yeah, those you. are the five. Yeah, that's the five. Uh, these are written in a way for React developers to relate to them. So it's more in the context of React components, which I thought was interesting. So yeah. give that a, a look. I've always been a fan of before. Always been a fan of Solid. Of course, this dates back to I think the early two thousands when Robert C. Martin uh, came up with this collection of principles in a, a, a paper. Um, if I remember correctly, it was called something like design principles and design patterns about software rot mm -hmm. or something like that. And, um, I think, uh, it w I think it was, it was the collection of those principles came about in that paper. And then the acronym itself, I think was, um, I think it was Michael feathers who came up with it in again, in the early 2000s. So there's a lot of, there was a lot of uh, momentum around this back in the early 2000s. That was a really cool time. In the early 2000s, we had dot net that got introduced. Uh, there's a lot of calm talk. There was a lot of talk about, Oh, um, solid, you know, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, O'Reilly was making its, you know, foray into books. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, yeah. And then more on design patterns, this time for .NET C Sharp. Nice. Uh, this is one that I found that is quite uh, useful. And it's it's something that's very small. In this case, it is a code snippet rather than like a whole library and all of that type right. of stuff. Uh, this is uh, the result pattern. So yet another pattern. Um, this is something I, I've used in the past uh and the way i wrote it out um i i think this person implemented it better so i i'm gonna okay. go revisit this but the idea is uh say you you have some sort of routine that you're running that can fail um this is kind of a functional way to deal with those failures so in dotnet you know you may have you may have a function that returns a uh, value. Yeah. And there's no way to really represent more than one outcome from a function in, in C sharp. Uh, this class, this result class allows you to return two things. And you kind of could think of it as a, a tuple, a tuple, however you want to pronounce that. Sure. Uh, but in this case, what we're doing is we're setting up a return type from a function that is going to be either one type or another functional programming languages sometimes call these ethers so you're going to say uh you know i want to uh get uh customers from a database for example yep. you're yep. either going to get back an array of customers or you're going to get back an error and this lets you deal with those error states by returning two things back from a, a single function. So you're going to get either a value back or an error back. Yep. And uh, this is simply wrapped by a result class. And yep. You have uh, yep. T value or T error, and then you can chain these things together as well, which makes things nice. They, they often call it like Rails programming, not to be confused with Ruby on Rails, um, where you're going to have you know many of these things um, chaining down the line and if at any point one of them fails you go off into an error path so you've got kind yep. of like the the happy path the sad path uh so I, I like the simple um class wrapper that was added here i looked uh really quickly before the show too there's a couple libraries that deal with this uh, so you can go all in on like a full library that that handles this or you could just kind of copy paste this nice little code snippet in um, and then use it directly, or you can go like full all, all in and get like a C sharp uh, functional programming library that has ethers in it. There's a couple of good ones out there. Yeah. Um, there's one. I didn't called, read this article, uh, but I'm I'm assuming that the author mentions, or I hope the author mentioned, uh, Com or Win32 because this dates back. i like, the whole result based style or pattern. Um, com uses extensively so there was the h result that would come back from win32 or com calls and 
anything that was uh was it s underscore okay anything that wasn't that um you'd always check to say if h result is not s okay um then you've got a problem on your hands and uh you'd have to inspect the h result so yeah i didn't see that one in there um okay. i i do like this though because it helps you clean up like try catch blocks all over the place in your code sure. so sure. instead you've got this nice um you know, you have a function that's going to return either an integer or an error. Yep. Uh, in this example, you you know pass in your uh, arguments and you get back either one of those two things. And then on the receiving end of that, um, you you're forced then to handle um, that error. So it gets uh, rid of kind of like the lazy um, developer that wants to just yep. like rethrow errors and not do anything yep. with them. Yep. Uh, so uh, I really like this one. All uh, right. Let's see what we got next. Because I lost all my organization, John. Everything's That's everywhere right. all at once. That's ah, like my brain. Don't worry about it. <laughs> all right. Server first web components with DSD, HTMX, and islands. Um, this is an article that I, I ran across uh, being a web developer for too long now. Uh, we have had uh, our hopes for a uh, component framework for the web. And years ago, we heard something called Web Components was coming, and everybody got uh -huh. excited, and then sure. you never heard about it again. Uh, so the underlying um, APIs for Web Components is in our browsers, and it has been improved upon over the years and it's finally starting to get a little bit of traction and this is a good article that outlines what you can actually do with web components today the you know there's there's fans of web web components already out there there are dozens of them and uh hopefully sometime this does catch you're a jerk on. you're a jerk <laughs> <laughs> there's lots of them come on i like web uh, components i liked them when they were first announced back in the day yeah, so it, the maturity is getting there. Um, it says uh, in 2020, this actually reached parity across all major browsers. So that's it's really not that long ago that uh, this was uh, something that all the browsers adopted. Uh, but like I said, it's been incrementally improved uh, over the last four or five years. And um, there's a lot of you know new capabilities there. So this author looks into uh, some of the techniques used in uh, modern web frameworks and then, you know, gives you a little bit of background of what web components are, how to define a template, uh, what some of the shadow DOM features are, and then shows you how to kind of construct one of these components using uh, the web API syntax for constructing components and then talks about uh, the declarative shadow DOM and then gives you some good uh, Kind of real world examples here on how to create like a list from an api type of a thing uh, so it's a it's a generally a good uh read and um i i think web components might start coming around i think you know the pendulum swings john we go like you know we had jquery right and then we went full like render it on the client using one of these fancy new frameworks like react angular uh -huh. all the above and I think we, we might be swinging back towards like web standards and like hitting that middle of the pendulum. So maybe we'll get some web components in there we'll see. Uh, in the near future. So uh, this goes into really good detail on all of it if you're interested in learning about web components. Well, the article was written by Rob Eisenberg, who's um, no slouch in terms yeah. of the web space. And he's been in this area for a very long time and I uh, love his writing. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll see. I mean, I've watched this space for a long time. We've had many attempts at this sort of thing. So we'll see. Yep. And then let's see what we've got up next. We got some Microsoft news. Yes. I think I may have lipped. I may have spoken to this. Uh, unable to share my screen, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because you were out. That was uh, quite the uh, hiccup at the beginning. If you didn't catch okay. that, uh, folks hey, in the chat room, hey, Napalm Codes, welcome to the show. 
All right, John, we've got new debugging and diagnostic features in Visual Studio 2022. Yeah, I was uh, talking to this without a screen, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, so Visual Studio 2022 uh, 17.11 has a lot of new capabilities around uh, debugging and uh, diagnostics. And there's a video that goes along with this. But essentially, um, it, the, the, some of the features include being able to break on async method exceptions, uh, very critical async can be uh, tricky, especially in a debug context. And so now um, you can catch those exceptions that are thrown by async methods, uh, which is obviously awesome. Uh, there's things like AI generated breakpoint expressions, those things can be also very difficult to uh, write carefully. So a, a breakpoint is something where you have a condition. And you can also have what are called trace points, which are kind of like break, they are breakpoints, but they're a special type of breakpoint, they basically do a console.log or write console.write line, um, typically for a trace point, or it will just log something. Um, so breakpoints, uh, being able to write those expressions for when certain conditions occur can be also tricky. They're they're not on the order of regex, but they are tricky. Um, some other features include debugging any CPU applications manifested to run as ARM64. Um, so Visual Studio natively supports building and debugging ARM64 apps on ARM-based processors. Unfortunately, applications built with the any CPU setting running on ARM64 machines will result in x64 emulation. So being able to um, debug those applications running on ARM64 is going to be super important. I know that you're really keen on Blazor. So there's yep. Blazor WebAssembly debugging, uh, which has been improved, which is awesome. Uh, being able to visualize link expressions and a whole bunch of other stuff as well. Um, so yeah, that's actually really that big. Out. I'm more excited yeah. about that one than anything. All right. I'm a heavy link user and sometimes it's gotten better over the years, but sometimes link still gets lost where you can't evaluate something um, until, or you can't see the values until it gets evaluated and it can get a little bit tricky. So yeah. you have to you kind of like, dive around inside of the ID to, to trigger those evaluations. So that's nice. Yep. So yeah, lots of niceness in there. And then we also have some new Git tooling features. Yeah, you know, if you're if you happen to be using Git, which I think is most of the world these days. <laughs> so uh, again, visuals 2022 17.11 has some new updates that have been added for everyone working with Git. Uh, basically, if you're utilizing GitHub, Azure DevOps, um, you can basically uh, elevate your experience inside of Visual Studio with these uh, updates. So some of the updates are things like being able to uh, be, do, be able to do more meaningful diffs. So if you're doing a pull request, um, for example, you can take a look at the comparisons, but you can actually incorporate the comments now. Um, there's a fix also that's been integrated for code lens. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else I saw in there. Um, there's also pull request creation updates as well, which is awesome. So lots and lots of stuff that's there. Um, so you can check out those innovations. I've been using the tooling um, for Git inside of Visual Studio, and I, I actually quite like it. And uh, nice. I've been doing some shows with uh, some coworkers of mine, and they they don't use it. They didn't, not that, that they couldn't, but they just were used to the command line. And then they saw me using right. it in Visual Studio. They're like, hey, that's actually pretty cool. I didn't know you could do half <laughs> the things you're doing in there. I'm yep. like, yeah, it's a, it's gotten you know way better over the years. Like they added you know, some functionality and I'm trying to remember which version of Visual Studio it was. And then at one point they just like ripped out the flooring and put it all back in. They're like, we're gonna remodel this experience. And they started over. And, um, you know, now GitHub uh, and Copilot and all of that is integrated uh, right into the, the IDE. And I, I think it's really great. Um, awesome. I don't jump out to the command line uh, very often. Uh, some people like it. That's fine. If you, you're good with the command line, go for it. I like to kind of stay in one place and not have to switch context if I don't have to. All right, John, this must have been something you added. Uh, I read yes. the entire NeoVim user <laughs> manual. Uh, the if, you have trouble, 
Yes, if you have trouble falling to sleep, don't worry, TJ's got your back. So TJ DeVries here is, uh, he's a, I guess this is his first time live streaming. And so as a new, uh, newly baked or freshly baked live streamer, he decided why not read the NeoVim user manual. Uh, NeoVim, of course, is the hyper extendable Vim based text editor that everyone knows and loves, or if you don't, you should. Uh, if you're into that sort of thing and uh, the user manual, uh, which, you know, it's pretty extensive. He's 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 basically spent the last 10 hours of his life reading it. So if you're, say, uh, yeah, did he if forget you... how to exit? Like, is that no? <laughs> that's... Is that why it's that's so right. long? <laughs> that's right. So, yeah, if you're at all interested, you can check out uh, this video. Uh, eh, you know, it's people. This is what people do these days. You know, they read user manuals online. So this is a go. nine hour stream. Yeah, 10 John. hours. You know, what's funny is the best comment I saw on this was uh, there was a person that wrote, um, I, I love, I would love a 10 hour version of this. And, uh, you know, there's, you know, interesting. So, and then people were suggesting, why don't you slow it down to like, you know, 0.75 speed or something. So. Wow. Yes. That wow is indeed. something else. Yes. Wow. Um, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you know, that's right. Right. From one person that likes to read specs to another, I, I spotted this one. Uh, this is something that uh, was added to um, our browsers in the way of CSS variables. Okay. Um, this just hit uh, baseline, which means available in all the major evergreen browsers, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, Safari, um, right. and you can use it today. Uh, I guess this started as part of the Houdini APIs. And if you're not familiar with Houdini, it is like a um, is a way to inject custom code uh, via JavaScript into the browser to handle CSS styling. Um, it's not something that people use very often in web development unless you're doing something you know highly specific. But I guess this came along for the ride. And this has to do with CSS custom properties. And okay. now they have a syntax for uh, writing CSS custom properties that's a little bit more verbose. It uses this property directive. And uh, you're able to give some um, type inference with uh, the property that you create. So with css variables uh before when you declare them you would use this double dash property name and set it and you could set that to any string you would like and it may represent a color it may re mm. represent uh a number it may you know be pixels a percentage that type of thing and there's no way of knowing as the end user what the type is when you call that property back. So you might try setting right. uh, a color to like 100%, and the, obviously that's not going to work because it's a percentage. Well, this allows you to assign types with the property. So this is just more CSS becoming a full-fledged programming language. Um, so this new property uh, declarative syntax here lets you um, add in those types and give a little bit more metadata around uh, the property. And then when you inspect, say, uh, a property in your dev tools, if you're trying to assign like the wrong type, again, like you assigned a percentage to a color, your browser is actually going to be able to understand where the, the error is coming from and tell you, hey, you can't use that, you know, right. to, to assign a color that's not a color that's a percentage so it'll it'll throw proper errors back and stuff now so uh this, this makes uh, the language just more powerful and um this is something that is widely available in your browsers now so I thought that was e evergreen evergreen browsers i guess yeah so all the evergreen browsers if you're still on ie then womp womp yeah womp womp i think it's the only one out there when you say uh all of safari the Safari might be one of those, you know, weird. Uh, cases Safari as well. was supported on there. If you look at the yeah. top up here, it says baseline newly available. Okay. And uh, if you expand this out it's since July. So, again, mm -hmm. this is really recent. This is just barely a month old. This feature works across all the latest devices and browsers. 
right. browser versions. Uh, might not work on older. So if you're using like the, the what is it called? The uh, Samsung Galaxy browser that comes with your phone? Maybe not. Mobile browsers, but, come on, all bets are off. You yeah, know. Opera, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Don't want to check your opera. um why don't you fire up netscape while we're at it ouch i think opera's still a thing you just there are dozens of them john dozens <laughs> that's right uh and speaking of the web i've got a security article that i thought uh, would interest you john yeah i know you like these um hacker yeah, yeah. type articles oh of course you gotta um, you got you know of course you have to wear the beanie and uh or sorry the hoodie and the uh the mask while hacking right yeah so. this is what hackers look like in, oh, in case in case you're at 100 percent sure this is what hackers look like there's yet another story with the same guy yeah and the same oh, he's hacking everything he's got the uh he's, he's hacking like a like a hacker he's awesome he went to hackers rs and got his um uh, hacker uniform uh but anyway uh this one is about uh using progressive web applications um to steal credentials from iOS and Android users. They broke so the sandbox. Is, yeah, well, n yes and no. So this okay. is a little bit phishing. So it's not quite ah. breaking the sandbox. It's more phishing okay. than it is um, doing something, you know, actually to the to the Sorry, PW gonna be another joke involving itself. the sandbox, but I won't say it. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> But what, what they've done here is they've kind of leveraged the fact that PWAs present themselves as um, installable applications and they're hard to differentiate between uh, native apps. And, you know, they, they've hackers have used to, that to their advantage. So what they did right. is it starts with a phishing attack. So they go through some type of some type of call sms or you know a, an ad on a, a shady right. website right and they prompt you with some sort of url so you know you make you might get like um i get these all the time and i i just immediately swipe them off my screen uh this is ups and your package is held up right uh or fedex or whatever delivery service you want to go with and then if you click on that link, God knows what it's going to send you. So, you know, somebody clicks on one of those links, they open the link and they're prompted with um, a, a uh, mock of the Apple or Google Play Store. Okay. And then when you click install, it installs a PD, uh, PWA that looks identical to your banking application or something else they want to steal credentials from. And if you go through the article here, here's a, a kind of a side by side, like this is the actual installable app. And then this is the PWA version of the app. And the only thing that really differentiates it is yeah. it's kind of the size of the icon. They didn't do a great job with the icon, but you could you could probably match that up even better. But this little Chrome logo yeah. that's floating above it is the only thing that would give you give it away. And if you're not a tech person, and you know you're just thumbing, thumbing through your phone and you see your banking app on there and don't realize the little chrome logos in front of it you may open it up and try to log in and yeah. that's what people are doing that's fair i understand now yeah so they haven't broken the sandbox they've just provided a way of installing something on the person's well they prompt the person to install they then mm -hmm. install they then run then at that point you know they're they're uh, impersonating basically their favorite website or not website, but app. And then yeah. getting creds that way. Gotcha. Yeah. And, you know, they're they're just leveraging the fact that that PWAs have gotten to the point where they're hard to distinguish between a uh, real desktop or real platform applications. Sure. iOS, Android. Uh, and unless you're a tech person, and you're you're paying close attention you don't really notice that you're running a pwa and they can run services that you would only find uh in the past on a desktop or, yeah. or native application yeah. geolocation all of that stuff so you know this stuff doesn't look or feel uh odd if you're not 
you know, paying attention to some of the more nuanced pieces of it. My favorite is when they uh, do stuff like this on the web and uh, they'll show you, uh, like they'll do that pop-up and it will show you some error and yeah. uh, the dialogue's in Windows. I'm like, I'm running Mac. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, uh, you know, my mom's gotten phone calls from the the ones that they want you to like install something on your Sure, this is Microsoft corporate security. We have detected a virus on you. I got a call when I worked at Microsoft. I got a call from the guy oh. and uh, from a from a guy <laughs> claiming that. And oh, I said, I work at Microsoft. And he's like, please, sir, don't claim you work for me. I'm like, I'm literally looking at my employee badge. What's your employee number? I'll look you up in the gal right now. And he's like, sir, I'm like, I'm like, I, I wanted to keep I wanted to start recording. This is before everyone started recording these calls oh. and, and like, you know, running VMs and letting them kind of, you know, see what happens. But uh, yeah, that was that was an interesting moment for me. Yeah, there's actually some great um, YouTubers that have yes. uh, exposed a lot of these things. And um, they're, you know, white hat uh, yes. hackers themselves. Yes. And there there was one where or multiple of them, rather, where they uh, reverse um, hacked the the hackers and they're showing the security cam into... yeah showing the security yeah. cam and all that yeah it's fun yeah they got into their security cameras they're like looking over the person's shoulder from the security camera while they're trying to like get into their bank accounts yeah. and stuff and yeah, they're yeah. like reading name badges and they're like so your real name is whatever and yes. you see the guy freak out yeah but uh, you know honestly i don't i don't i'm not usually a vengeful type of person but these people have stolen so much money from so many innocent oh, people yeah. I don't care. I love when these guys get owned. I'm like, good for them. Good for those guys, those streamers who are owning these guys. I think we need more people like that owning these uh, these shops that are taking advantage of people. Uh, Mark Rober did one as well. I don't know if you're familiar with him, um, where not only did they infiltrate the uh, the hackers through the webcams and all of that, but they actually got a third party to deliver a box of cockroaches. Oh, jeez. And deploy it inside of the the hacker farm, whatever they call those right, things, right. where all the the hackers are. Yeah, um, they're not hackers; they're just social stuff. engineers. That's all they are, and yeah, they're bad they, ones. They got, bad. I think there was four of them, and they got three of them shut down. Yeah. So, yeah, good. Did you get to cover this one, John? I did, when I did, yeah. we had the yeah, technical yeah. break yeah, yeah. there, okay. Yeah, it's all good. So, uh, and then finally. This is the last link I've got here, and I'll paste all these up and put them in uh, in my LinkedIn newsletter. Uh, the final one here is uh, from Daniel Roth, and it's a YouTube video. Uh, he's talking about what's next in ASP.NET Core and Blazor. This was a session at VS Live nice. on the campus up there in Redmond. Probably looks familiar, John. Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, it's still... They've done some remodeling, yet it still hasn't changed, right? This is uh, the auditorium one in uh, whatever that building's called uh, over some there. Building, it's building 31. Whatever, sure. There's so many yeah. of them. So uh, this this session, he, he kind of dives into uh, what's new in .NET 9, uh, what the Blazor improvements are, status asset optimization. We talked about that last week. Yeah. Um, the open AC API support is really cool. Um, so there's been some changes with, uh, what is the open API package swagger? Yes. Uh, I oh, guess that's, swagger that's, with... that's the old one. Like it's now Co yeah. Coyota from Microsoft. There's a few others as well. Yeah. So the swagger got deprecated because the, uh, maintainers, they, were basically, I guess, in maintenance mode. They weren't adding new features or anything like that. So the repo hadn't seen any movement for like two or three years or something. Yeah. So uh, Microsoft kind of booted that out and then put in a, a replacement for it. There's some really cool stuff in the video. I don't want to spoil it all, so go check it out. Um, see what they're doing with the open API stuff. I thought it was really cool. Nice. Um, and they're, you know, I think the things that we talked about in the Visual Studio uh, debugger experience are mentioned in here as well. Nice. There we go. Uh, Coyota is an open API generator tool for building HTTP clients. Um, yeah, I, that's that's definitely what's talked about in here. Mm -hmm. um, so you can kind of build out um, like mock clients and stuff with mm -hmm. it too. Mm -hmm. So really, really cool stuff. 
give yep. this a watch. It's about an hour. It was a session at uh, the VS Live conference, and um, it's definitely worth it if you're doing any ASP.NET to give this a look. Nice. I, I think I think that is that is all of the links. Did I miss any of yours, John? Did we get them all in there? Yeah, we got them all. We're good. All right, great. Uh, so I post these up on my LinkedIn page. Um, they come through as a newsletter. I will share them there. Um, I'll drop a link here as well to where that will show up. Uh, if you give me just one second, I will find it. Don't log off. <laughs> yeah, don't log what do you off. Mean, I don't want to tap dance for another 10 minutes. <laughs> uh where is my screen at there we go so uh, this was last week's newsletter here ah there you go so i'll drop this into chat um if you drop into that feed uh there's a spot to um subscribe in there you'll see new posts pop up in that area there so you can see uh, i try to post these every every week and uh, I'll get right on typing this one in now that my browser is back up with the links in it. <laughs> so, like at the start of the show, if you missed it, like all of my devices completely shut down because I think I think Streamyard crashed. I don't know huh. if it was a browser thing or what, but like all of my devices, anything audio, video, totally went offline. My yeah. headset, my microphone, my Sounds camera. Sounds great now. <laughs> yeah, it all went off. And I rebooted and came back, and I think um, there was something cached in it uh, in StreamYard, and it kept blowing up. So I had to completely like log out of StreamYard, <laughs> and then like reset all of my equipment again, and then come back Fantastic. and it started working. So awesome! We recovered and we did a show, John. Thank you for hey. filling in for the hey, awkward no problem. time there. Your tears, your tears mean nothing to me. I will, I will do whatever is required. <laughs> We will see you again next week.